Welcome to Philosophy of Value Workshops number 33 of series 9. The question for today is, what is a state of value sufficiency as a principle of ethics and human life? Reading from one of my works, The Pursuit of Value, chapter 2, section 9. In order to solve the problem of human existence, we must first understand what human existence is. And the most fundamental way of defining human existence is as consciousness and reflective consciousness. And I've argued that the most basic elements of consciousness are cognition, affect, will and value. I have also argued that the fundamental problem of consciousness must be resolved in terms of value. And to do this, I have advocated the principle of an affirmation or the will to value leading to a certain independence or sufficiency of value. I previously explained what this is, but I also need to define it in detail. So that's what I'm doing in this workshop. The sufficiency of value that I'm talking about is an enhanced property of value. So we must first define value. Yet I've argued that the concept of value has been neglected in ancient and modern philosophy. And there's a further problem, consciousness, of which value is a constituent has also been neglected. So to give context, we can briefly outline that relation between value and consciousness. We can start to outline that relation by means of the standard cognitive-non-cognitive -cognitive distinction. This is a classification employed by analytic philosophy of mind into two types of mental state. But the cognitive, non-cognitive cl classification is biased in favour of cognition and defines non-cognitive states ne negatively. So in my view, we should replace the non-cognitive category with a more specific affect, will and value. This results in a classification of four types of mental state of cognition, affect, will and value. These four states can now help us to define value and different kinds of value by contrast and comparison. Yet we should first note that analytic philosophy regards such states as separate and distinct from each other. Whereas phenomenology, existentialism and myself regard them as overlapping and interpenetrating. Examples of affect states include both feeling and emotion, such as pain, <coughs> happiness, affection, despair and anger. Examples of cognitive states are thought, perception, reason, knowledge and belief. Yet values and value states also imply co cognitive states because they value something, that is, an idea. With respect to the will, wanting is a directional capacity of the will that implies value. These examples show the interrelated and overlapping character of mental states. The definition of affect states is particularly re relevant to the definition of value and sufficient value. This is because we can compare sufficient value with affect states and contrast it to cognitive states. We can first compare value sufficiency with the sufficiencies of the affect states of happiness and pleasure. The sufficiency of pleasure is that it remains ple pleasurable regardless of beliefs or social disapproval. Happiness is more subject to cognition, but happiness is satisfying in itself without endorsement. So the particular kind of sufficiency that value has incomparable to, but not the same as, that of 
happiness and pleasure. They are comparable due to their relative independence from cognitive endorsement and support. Yet these three states of pleasure, <coughs> happiness and value have different origins and different characteristics. Pleasure typically has physiological origins and is less influenced by cognitive factors. Happiness is more subject to circumstances and supporting cognitive factors. So sufficiencies of value can be compared to the sufficiency of affect states in having phenomenal properties. But value states have a different ontology with a greater volitional and qualitative aspects. But some examples of value sufficiency are moral fortitude, magnanimity, dignity, love and self-esteem. We can now contrast cognitive states to both value states and states of sufficient value. One aspect of this contrast is the fact-value distinction that is also part of the cognitive-non-cognitive -cognitive cl classification. Yet cognitive states can also be contrasted to value states and non-cognitive states using the concept of intentionality. That is, cognitive states can be said to be co constituted by their intentional objects. Belief, for instance, is constituted by whatever idea is believed. That is, belief cannot exist without something that is believed. But this isn't the whole story because we can have stronger or weaker beliefs. We can note here that Brentano student Swadowski d distinguished the content of intentionality from its object. Husserl then named the objects of intentionality as its noema and its contents as noesis. We don't really need these technical terms, yet they indicate the explicit nature of this analysis. The point is that whereas co cognitive states can be defined and constituted by their intentional objects, non-cognitive states like value can be defined and constituted by their experiential internal content. That is, it is the inner experience that largely defines and constitutes values and value states. And that method is crucial for defining the substantive character of value sufficiency. So value can be contrasted to cognition, yet we still need to note their overlapping and inter interpenetrating nature. Philosophers and social scientists here have for example, emphasised the value-laden nature of facts. Hilary Putnam has expressed this as the collapse of the fact-value dichotomy. But the value-laden nature of facts has led, in part, to mistaking the fundamental character of value. This has led to states being described as values that are not values and are values in name only. Such mistakenly described values are truth values, numeric values, monetary values and values of quantity. My objection is that these values don't have the subjective experiential content essential to values. And on this view, these values only seem to be describable as values analogously. That is, they are described as values, but should be described as properties or quantities, or we could call them pseudo-values. We have here the common problem of one word, value, with two meanings. Of course, the word value has many more meanings than two. But this ambiguity is, is particularly misleading. This is because the word value is also used in quite a different way to describe quantification. A comparable ambiguity to these two meanings of value is found in the two words 
epistemic and experiential meaning. Epistemic meaning about what a sentence means is comparable to the meaning of value as quantification. Experiential meaning, on the other hand, is comparable to the meaning of value as experience. And further ambiguity surrounds the meaning of the crucial word sufficiency, also an opportunity for clarification. Firstly, we have noted above a kind of sufficiency that applies to pleasure and happiness. Secondly, we also aren't focusing on the logical sufficiency of necessary and sufficient conditions. And thirdly, neither are we talking about the sufficiency in the principle of sufficient reason. Leibniz's principle of sufficient reason is that everything must have a reason or a cause. But I'm talking about a subjective sufficiency of value that we are trying to explicate here. And there is a strong school of thought that holds that values, but properly described, must have subjective qualities. Ralph Perry, for example, argued that values don't exist until someone desires something. And I agree with him. So in this view, an item labelled as having $5 by a computer, without anyone knowing, would not have a value. And because no one experiences that value, by valuing it, or by purchasing the item. Its description of value is of a different kind to the <coughs> experimental value that I propose here. Moreover, I believe that describing such value is not only misleading, but erroneous. That's why truth values, numeric values, and monetary values shouldn't be called values. John Mackey also argues that there are no objective values in the fabric of the world. I previously discussed Mackey's arguments, so I, won't so I won't go over them again here. But it's important to understand what he means by objective value. In Mackey's argument, the word objective refers to substantive ontological existence, not <coughs> not universality. So the rejection of objective values doesn't preclude the existence of normative ethical values. But more relevantly here, Mackey's rejection of objective values infers that values are subjective. And it is that subjectivity that we're talking about with respect to value sufficiency. A corollary of Mackey's rejection of objective values is his argument that there are no intrinsic values. That is, despite their acceptance by many leading philosophers such as Nozick, Dworkin and Parfit, there are no intrinsic values in the world in the form of principles, actions or material objects. And among these, I would, inc I would include the above so-called values of quantification. But the rejection of the intrinsic values in the world does not reject intrinsic values in the form of mental states. Indeed, mental states are the only c candidates of intrinsic value, of which some are intrinsic values. And our key state and concept of value sufficiency is presented here as having intrinsic value. But not all intrinsic values need have value sufficiency. This is because some intrinsic values can be trivial and insufficient to our needs. For example, my love of animals isn't the same as my love for my friend, which is less than my love for my wife. That is, love is always of intrinsic value, but is relative and may not be sufficient to live by or die for. And to make such values culminating human objectives, they need to have criteria of priority. And a definition of intrinsic values, usually contrasted to attributed values, will help us to define sufficient value. Intrinsic values 
are valuable due to their own <coughs> inherent qualities. Instrumental values are attributed with value as means towards some other end. Yet the kinds of things that are of intrinsic value is highly contested. But I want to suggest a way of defining intrinsic value that will help to define sufficient value. To begin with, I hold that not only mental states and people are candidates of intrinsic value, but people who don't value themselves or want to die seem to be exceptions to this rule. To introduce another way of defining intrinsic value, I first want to introduce another way of defining <coughs> ethics. In my view, ethics is about making judgments deemed to be ethical that reflect value back onto the agent. They are deemed to be ethical because those judgments aren't fixed or definitive. You don't have to agree, but what is uh, important here is the explanation of the reflective process. To resolve the problem of people who don't value themselves, we can also make intrinsic value a reflexive process. That is, there is a sense in which there are no intrinsic values, but are made so by this reflective process. So in the case of people, they might only have value because they value themselves. But it might be psychologically or ontologically impossible to not value themselves. Yet I now want to apply this reflective principle to value states that are thought to be of intrinsic value. These are states like love, self-esteem, moral fortitude and magnanimity that are also sufficient values. In my view, these states necessarily contain a reflexive evaluative process that gives them value. For example, Love is an act that necessarily attributes value to the agent as well as to the loved. My point in all this is that intrinsic values necessarily attribute values to themselves and that sufficient values are intrinsic values that also attribute values to themselves and that this attribution can be performed by the degree of sufficient or will to value leading to a sufficiency of value. I will shortly outline several other criteria of the many that can ca characterise sufficient values. But I first want to list, illustrate and explain a number of sufficient values. Yet I also want to say that I call them sufficient values because they are sufficient to the tasks <coughs> required of them. So they not only have a particular cr criteria, but they're also relative and depend upon their situations. For example, <clears throat> as earlier, I may love animals, but my love for children may be sufficient to give up my life for them. In the case of self-esteem, we may find sufficient fortitude to overcome the demands of social esteem. This is admirable but the quality of that fortitude will depend on our conception of ourselves. <clears throat> also note that self-esteem makes obvious the reflexive character of sufficient values. Yet a more refined form of value sufficiency can be found in moral fortitude. Moral fortitude is another instance of sufficient independence to do the right thing in difficult circumstances. It also evokes morality as one of the highest human values. My last example here of value sufficiency is Aristotle's crowning virtue of magnanimity. Aristotle describes ma magnanimity as greatness of soul or megalopsychia that didn't need re retribution. Yet Aristotle associated magnanimity with self-worth as well as big-heartedness and generosity. And as Nietzsche also held, generosity implies an abundance of widely shared value. But I want to get back to outlining explicit criteria of sufficient value. 
and I can do this by further comparing and contrasting intrinsic value with sufficient value. Firstly, G. E. Moore and Robert Nozick define intrinsic value by its degree of organic unity that I call coherence. But as Nozick himself points out, organic unity can be a property of negative events like evil plans. And Nozick accepts that material objects like art, <coughs> organic life and theories can have intrinsic value. But this material and objective account of intrinsic value is unacceptable to Mackey and myself. Yet this needn't preclude organic unity and coherence as criteria of certain refined value and value sufficiency. That is, thanks to Moore and Nozick, we can see that the inner coherence of value can contribute to its quality. And conversely, incoherence, such as cognitive dissonance, can detract from the quality of value. Internal in incoherence of value can also be expressed as anxiety, <coughs> alienation and anomie. Yet another form of coherence is consistency as coherence through time. One example of coherence and consistency leading to sufficiency of value is shown in Sartre's Spirit of Seriousness. The spirit of seriousness misrepresents subjective values as objective to avoid freedom and responsibility. The classic example is to um, inauthentically say, in bad faith, that I have no choice. And these are instances of a lack of value or a lack of sufficiency of value. A similar example of a lack of sufficiency of value is found in Bernard Williams' cr criticism of self-indulgence. This is a moral self-indulgence of caring about oneself, caring about other people, rather than actually caring about other people. Yet the spirit of seriousness is also a failure to value value because it is valuing objects or ideas. And arguably, only people and mental states are candidates of intrinsic value, not objects or ideas. And not to value value fails to affirm value as a will to value leading to a sufficiency of value. The affirmation or will to value leading to a sufficiency of value can be explained as an aggregating process. That is, the act of valuing has a proclivity towards substantive values like moral fortitude and magnanimity. This is because valuing is an aggregating process that has tra trajectory and directional content. That is, making certain value choices add to and reinforce a particular <coughs> ambience and type of value. For example, financial values and their pursuit channels values into the financial sphere, whereas <coughs> ethical pursuits develop moral and other human values. And the will to value leads to sufficiencies of value. I would also like to mention some other ways in which this process of value development can be expressed. Sartre advised refraining from appropriating things for their own sake, which leads away from value. Jung spoke of individuation, that we might call a synthesis of value promoted by valuing value. Aristotle told others to practice the virtues to internalize them, to become second nature. Yet we can say practice appropriate values that will lead to sufficiencies of value. My point here is that valuing value is a process that leads to more substantive and sufficient value and not to value value is thereby self-defeating in that it leads away from greater human satisfaction. These ideas of not valuing value as self-defeating also lead to self-validation 
as expressing value sufficiency. But self-validating principles in logic and mathematics aren't thought possible in physics or ethics. Yet self-validation can be demonstrated in value processes, briefly here, as before, and elsewhere. For instance, not to value value is self-defeating because value is a culminating state of human satisfaction. It is also self-negating because value must be presupposed by any system of value judgments. And not to value value is contradictory because value is presupposed by the system of value judgments that we may have adopted. And because not valuing value is self-defeating, self-negating and contradictory, we can say that to value value is a self-validating principle that expresses a sufficiency of value. And this self-validation and sufficiency of value translates into the ambition of ethics being its own foundation. This ambition to make ethics its own foundation is also motivated by the failure of other foundations like God, nature, reason, physics and biology. So we find Ronald Dworkin speaking of the independence of morality as separate department of knowledge. And Bernard Williams makes a similar point when he says that Nietzsche rightly claims that morality demands to be understood as self-sufficient. Aristotle also qualifies eudaimonia, or the supreme good, with the properties of self-sufficiency and finality. The notion of finality reveals Aristotle's definitive conception of the good that we cannot agree with. But the self-sufficiency of the good is a moral concept that can be taken to be a sufficiency of value. Then value sufficiency in um, ethics transfers to religion with Nietzsche's idea of the self-sufficiency of a god. Divine characteristics of omniscience and supreme good are all expressions of sufficiency. Yet just as importantly, God is also the believer's highest value. And integrating these two ideas, God mythologically re represents both sufficiency and the highest human values. And integrating sufficiency and the highest value into one principle, we get the notion of value sufficiency. This of course leads to my own philosophical conclusion of value sufficiency yet it need not be less true because of that. Yet these two expressions of value sufficiency in terms of religion and um, ethics as God and eudaimonia indicate how it must be defined and qualified. Firstly, value sufficiency can't be a maximization or quantification of values but must entail quality. And secondly, human beings and their capacities are finite subject to limitation and even degradation or error. Human beings aren't absolute spirits which can realise their wishes just by willing them. They need the supportive cognitive frameworks of ideology like religion or philosophical theory. And a value sufficiency adequate for humans must entail a variety of qualities as well as entailing a relative sufficiency for a spectrum of needs and satisfactions. And this means that sufficiencies of value are always works in progress. So value sufficiency can't be defined just as a form of independence from social or ideological support. There are many other crucial factors that must be integrated into an adequate concept of value sufficiency like justice, sacrifice, dignity, altruism, compassion, alterity, truth and a reconciliation of loss. And as I have argued elsewhere that attenuation and absence are desirable qualities of value. That is, there is an interesting relation between truth, absence and value. 
To begin with, both truth and moral value make inescapable claims on our will. And I've also argued that the concept of truth, like the highest good, is in principle indefinable. Yet many thinkers like Kant and Popper regard the concept of truth as having a regulative function. And truth can have this regulative function because this indefinability is an absence that is inducive to value. It is inducive to value not only because its openness to redefinition offers possibilities of creating value, as well as that the idea of truth invites us to produce the highest values that we can find, but also because the indefinability of value discourages unwanted ideological support. And that again, <clears throat> independence from such support is preferable to dependence. Moreover, it's fortuitous that both truth and highest values or moral values can't be definitively defined. Both truth and your highest values are thereby subject to this principle of absence or attenuation. That is, absence or attenuation is a criterion of the quality of cognition that determines the quality of value. Examples are moral fortitude and maturity as independence from social endorsement. That is, the quality of value and value sufficiency will also be determined to some extent by its object or objects. And those objects might be considered significant like truth or God, insignificant like apples and pears. Or they can be determined by the attenuation of or the near absence of cognition. This is part of the dialectic between value and cognition that I explicate elsewhere. That is, value sufficiency is produced by a quality direction or an alignment with the highest value that can be conceived. It is a trajectory towards an as yet undefined future that is constantly unfolding. So the quantification and maximization of value are eclipsed by attenuation, absence and quality. And on this view, refinements of value are also produced by absent or inexplicit objects of value. As a final sceptical note, we should consider a physicalist or neurological perspective. That is, sufficient values are just habituated neurological pathways that produce resilient attitudes. We can indeed agree that neurological processes are involved in all mental events, but the phenomenal experience of sufficient values isn't identical to neurological events, and many mental states are produced by ambient levels of consciousness rather than neurology. Such ambient levels of consciousness can be found in differences between infants and adults, and they produce states such as personal identity, capacities of abstraction, and states of value sufficiency. The opposing physicalist or neurological position has never been proven, and Donald Davidson has had to describe such as anomalous monism. This is due to the many problems of the physicalist or neurological accounts of such states. In this study I've been trying to explain and illustrate value sufficiency rather than give evidence for it. So we conclude by again listing a number of states of value sufficiency like moral fortitude, patience, self-esteem, love, magnanimity, maturity, and courage, as well as accepting other states of value sufficiency that, we've, that we have yet to discover or create from future resources. We compare these states of value sufficiency to the sufficiency of affect states like 
happiness or pleasure. And we contrasted them to different kinds of logical sufficiency in cognitive states. Yet even as a property of value states, we found insufficient value states like the spirit of seriousness, inauthenticity, and self-indulgence. In explanation, criteria of value sufficiency were cited like subjectivity, intrinsic value, coherence, and consistency. And that value sufficiency also had the property of self-validation that he sought after by ethical theory. I argued that value sufficiency is self-validating because not to affirm or value value is self-defeating, self-negating and contradictory, and that the reflective process of valuing value is central to value sufficiency. Yet value sufficiency isn't just maximization or quantification, but must entail quality. And that quality is expressed both in the idea of God as the believer's highest value, as well as in <coughs> Aristotle's ethical concept of eudaimonia as having certain self-sufficiency. And that value sufficiency is not only defined by its quality of experience and intent, but also by the quality of the objects of that intent, whether truth or one's highest conceivable value. When explaining these things, people tell me that my ideas aren't new, but I'm not trying to produce new ideas. I'm just trying to resolve problems that I think need to be resolved. And in doing that, I seem to have come up with ideas and concepts that appear to be new, such as value states, value theory ethics, the will to value, and value sufficiency. And if anyone knows of previous articulations of these ideas, please tell me. So let me have your comments or criticisms at the meeting or on websites like meetup.com or Zoom.